the Joe Rogan experience. I want to ask you about Lyme disease. Sure. Lyme disease is a scary one, right? And uh, I mean, so many of my friends on the East Coast have it. It's really terrifying that that that, that part of the country in particular seems to be like really badly infected with these, these ticks that carry this disease. What can people do to prevent that? And what, what can we, there's no vaccine for Lyme disease. And I know there was at one point mm-hmm, in time, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but people were having an issue with, uh, I mean, uh, a good friend of mine, her dad actually got Lyme disease from the vaccine mm-hmm. before they discontinued it. Um, what can someone do to sort of, uh, protect themselves. Yeah. Well, Lyme disease in of itself is a fascinating story. I've actually been involved with it since its early discovery in the 1980s. And Minnesota, Wisconsin was a big focus of the upper Midwest. And this is a story that I think you'll find interesting is, is that even though it was discovered primarily in the eastern part of the United States, named after Lyme, Connecticut, um, it's a disease that actually probably originated in the upper Midwest. And I tell you that because uh, it turns out that there is a focus in northern Wisconsin and, and east central Minnesota where there's Lyme disease, there's another disease called anaplasmosis, there's another disease, Babesia, et cetera, that all seem to have a similar kind of tick, human, deer kind of component. And back in the uh, CCC days of the 1930s, the white-tailed deer population had been virtually totally depopulated from the northeast. And so they actually trapped deer in northern Wisconsin and took them out and deposited them in New York and Connecticut and so forth. Wow. And most of those deer are actually deer that, you know, today their great, 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 great grandfather came from Wisconsin. Wow. And guess what? When you move deer, you move ticks. In fact, I was involved with a study that the Wisconsin Division of Health did and a colleague of mine, the late Jeff Davis, where up in northern Wisconsin – as deer would come into the check station, uh, they would actually measure the number of ticks that were attached to the nape of the neck, okay? And they had a lot of thing drawn. And they asked hunters who were driving back to Madison and Milwaukee if they would be willing to check in at a station down there for just a second, and then they were going to count the ticks again. And it turned out that as the vehicles come rolling down from Highway 51 from northern Wisconsin, get on the Interstate 9094 and go to Milwaukee or Madison, the ticks just kept falling off. By the time they get to Madison or Milwaukee, the ticks are almost all gone. Well, guess, lo and behold, where all the Lyme disease and so forth started to show up, right along the interstate corridor. Wow. Because the ticks were coming off, and then they were getting into the local deer in that population. And so it's exactly what you said. The ticks were moving. They're moving. Okay, they've moved, and they're now infected. So I think that that this Lyme disease issue is a key one. Lyme disease is really an important disease. It's real, no question about it. The challenge we have is, is that there's a lot of people that assume that they have chronic Lyme infection. And, you know, the data on that is just really, really not there to support that these people are chronically infected. But they do have an immune response, likely, that occurs where it sets up this trigger And so they're sick. They actually have something. But it's not treating it again for the bacteria infection. It's the fact that this body, your own body's immune system, as we've talked about several times today, it starts attacking you. I think it's a similar picture we see with chronic fatigue syndrome, same kind of thing. These people really are sick. They really do have problems. But it's not something you can treat. So when people, I, I have a challenge because when people take IV antibiotics at extended periods of time for Lyme disease, You know, the data, there's four different studies now that have been done where people have had what we call a uh, double-blind placebo-controlled trial where half got the drug, half got an IV, but no drug. And it turned out all four of these studies in Lyme disease, the people who got just the placebo did just the same as the people who got the drug. And I worry that we're using antibiotics a lot there. And this is where I just mentioned earlier about Clostridium difficile. We actually had a patient in Minnesota that died from the IV treatment for what was chronic Lyme disease and wouldn't have been helpful. And so we need a lot more research in this area to figure out what are these people getting? What is it that we can shut off so that they don't have this chronic Lyme disease picture, knowing that it's not actually just you had to treat them more. Treatment's not going to help them with the antibiotics anymore. And so I think that that's uh, an area that uh, 
Uh, we just need a lot more work in, and, and the numbers are growing, as you know. Yeah. So we don't we don't know what's happening. Well, there's a we have enough data to say your immune system is really cranked up. Right. Your immune system is you know it's reacting just like, to something. Yeah, it's like rheumatoid arthritis. A lot of things we you know we you know thank God for our immune system. It's what fights off all the bad things we have. But sometimes that immune system gets turned on too much, yeah. and then it uh, takes on us. Okay, yeah. and and it goes back to the coronavirus. That's why a lot of these people are dying right now. Is this over vigorous immune response? And Lyme disease is kind of that same inciting event where we have evidence now that you could be infected with the bacteria. But if we treat you, it's not like it's like every other bacteria. You can really get rid of it, but you still have this chronic illness that's occurring. And what I think is hard is is that we see people who have this who are desperate to have somebody understand what they have, and they end up going to people who take real advantage of them, clinicians mm. who charge them an arm and a leg for things that are not going to help them. And what we need is a lot more research on what is actually going on and what kind of drugs can we use to reverse this immune system disorder. I have a, a friend of mine who's a UFC fighter, Jim Miller, and he's he's got Lyme disease, and it's pretty bad. Mm -hmm. and he takes a stack of pills. I don't know what he takes every day. Yeah. What do you think someone is taking, and wh what what benefit would they get from that? I couldn't tell. I mean, I'm I'm not you know without knowing what it's there, but again, more often than not, if he's been adequately treated. Um, it's not that the bacteria is still growing in him like it might be for a lot of – It's an autoimmune It's response. autoimmune, which is real. I mean that's the other thing is I think these people just want to be legitimized and said, you know, I'm really sick. Right. And I'm not I'm, – it's not something I'm, you know, mentally ill about, whatever. But then we've got to figure out what it is that you have. And so I, we uh, really don't know. We don't know yet. We don't know. Wow, but and it's been around for so long. I know, but this is where we need a lot more research about this of, in terms of what is it that's making these people like this. And this is really important. And is there anything they can do to eradicate the ticks? You know, the, this is another thing you'll find interesting. Um, in Minnesota, prior to the arrival of the first white men, the Native Americans burnt much of our state all the time. The prairies through much of the territory, and even in northern Wisconsin, northern Minnesota, we had the classic, you know, pine forest. Fire would wipe through. And with that, it would open up so much of the forest that you'd have a very different kind of, of, of mammals, population, deer, et cetera, et cetera. And with the suppression of fire, what's happened is we now have, instead of having these old growth forests, we have all this younger, you know, non-pine or any kind of, I mean, like the oak trees of the upper Midwest are all disappearing because oak trees need sunlight. And fires, what kept, they were very resistant to fire. And so the old oak forests and so forth would would survive because of fire. Whereas today, with no fire, you know, the elms and the maples and everything else comes in and the buckthorn and all that kind of stuff and takes over. So so what's happening is, in, in our state of Minnesota, is we have a really good example of this, is we're losing our moose. And the big primary reason is brainworm. It's brainworm. A brainworm. It's a type of parasite that's common in white-tailed deer but causes no problems. In moose, it actually causes a brain infection and it kills them. And guess why it's happening? Because the deer range has moved farther and farther north in Minnesota. Try to keep this I'm sorry. Yep, yep. The, 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 the has moved farther in north, northern Minnesota because of lack of fire because the forest is changing. So now where there only used to be moose, we're seeing deer and moose. And where that intersection is, we're starting to see moose develop this brainworm infection because mm. it's from the deer. So the tick population has changed too, and it's largely due to the fire, lack of fire in many places. In the Northeast, never used to be like it was. We had fire all the time that would clear out these areas, and it was just part of natural everything. So, so one of the challenges we have with ticks is they're here. We're not going to change how we live, suburbs and, you know, trees and all of that. Could controlled burns eliminate a lot of them? They do because what they do is they just don't eliminate the ticks. But what they do is they eliminate, for example, the white field mice or, you know, all these different species that are important to the ticks. And then they bring in different species that will, will be there. So, I mean, this is a big debate in Minnesota right now. I mean, we're, we're losing all these moose to brainworm. Ironically, the moose are population is expanding dramatically in Isle Royal. Why? Because there's no deer out there. And so they're not getting brainworm out there. So people have said, you know, the, we're going to lose our moose. Well, it's, a, it's the deer. So, so fire actually has helped the moose. In areas in northern Minnesota where there's been a lot of fire, 
the moose population is growing because the deer are not there because exactly those mammals, those rodents and so forth are very different in burnt out areas than they are in, in non-burnt out areas. Well, they do control burns in some states. I, got, I had a friend who yeah. was hunting in Washington State a couple yeah. of years ago, and he said it was really weird because there's these massive fires in the distance that were actually being controlled. They do it on purpose. Yeah, which is a lot better than having the out-of-control fires where you have so much fuel. Yeah. And, you know, if you haven't had a forest fire in 8,500 years in an area, the fuel in there is huge. Yeah. And so actually they do that in northern Minnesota too. They're doing controlled burns. And in the prairies, of course, we do controlled burns all the time. So, But the problem with the east coast is you're dealing with a lot of these sort of almost residential areas yeah. that have yeah. all these ticks. Yeah, you can't. Yeah. And there you can't. There we have to find ways. That, that's, that's where we really have to have vaccines and treatments for these diseases. We're not going to get rid of the ticks. So what we have to do is figure out, uh, I mean, wouldn't it be incredible if we have a cocktail vaccine for – you know, Babesia for Lyme disease for yeah. animal, that's what we need. Is there any kind of an animal that eats ticks? Birds, yeah, birds will eat them, but not enough. Not enough. They're not no, doing their no, job. they're they're doing very well. Thank you. Ticks do very well, and that's another issue. Uh, you know, for some of the larger mammals, as you know, tick predation can get so heavy, particularly in 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 certain times of the year, that the that really. Literally, it takes a lot of blood out of these large animals, even though they're so big. Yeah, that's a lot of blood. I went down a rabbit hole the other day online, and I saw this one deer that was covered in these frisbee-sized yeah. patches of ticks. That's exactly. They were all swollen, all, and they're full of blood. Oh, so and, disgusting! And, you know, and, and, and it happens day after day. So it is a hit on them. It's a real hit on them. You should pull up a picture of that just yeah. to freak people out that are watching <laughs> online. Just they need to see this. Yeah, yeah, it's I mean, pretty amazing. It's one of those things that when you talk about ticks and you talk about Lyme disease. Most people, their eyes glaze over. They don't even care. It's not affecting me until someone in your family has it. Yep. Um, there's a guy that I know who was a former UFC fighter, Marcus Davis, who he put – he had, his wife got Lyme disease and he spent hundreds of thousands of dollars trying oh. to – trying to help her and, and do something about it and treatments and all these different things for it. Yeah. It's a, it's a real challenge. It's a challenge. And this is another area, again, you know, when you think of the amount of money we lose in just lost time, let yeah. alone pain and suffering, yeah. what an investment to make in this. I mean, this this is the kind of thing. And this is where infectious diseases really need a renaissance. I mean, well, we, we can do a lot here. We pulled up a chart of the United States where they showed the areas that are affected by these ticks and what what percentage of ticks carry Lyme disease they've tested. And some places in the Northeast, it's in the 60%. Oh, exactly. Yeah, it is. It's huge. That's and, so it's, scary. and it's growing. And it's growing. Yeah. I mean, and you, I mean, you understand how wildlife has changed. I mean, look at – to think that we have all these wild coyote populations in New York City now. Yes. I mean, I mean it's amazing how Every animals – Every single city in the country. Uh, yeah. You know, what the rats aren't doing, the coyotes are taking yeah. over. And it's, it's, it's a challenge. I mean, these are fe- infectious disease issues too. They're, they're very real. Yeah, they have coyotes in Central Park. They do. Yeah, absolutely. They have yeah. them in the Bronx. They have them in – I mean, it's weird. It's yeah. weird to see because – this is something that just didn't exist before. Look at this. Look oh, at these. there it is. That's, I mean, I'm for a good one, that's but, okay. Yeah. That's okay. That's not, not, that's not the best I've seen, but it's gross enough. Yeah, it is. It, it gives you a good sense of it, though. Yeah. Uh, Dan Flores, who has been a uh, guest on the podcast before, yeah. has a great book called Coyote America that sort of details how this came to be and how these coyotes have uh, – oh, look at that all over that poor deer's face. Oh, look face. at that. Look at the oh. eye. Look at the eye in the fawn. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they're disgusting. Yeah, uh, but the coyotes uh, the, about how when they got rid of the wolves and uh, they tried to do the same to the coyote, they just actually expanded their territory. I mean, they're sneaky, very clever little animals. Adaption. Yeah. Just adapt. like microbes, adaption. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>